Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another lecture. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about Bertrand Russell. So, uh, Russell was a very interesting person, uh, 20th, well, 19th to, to 20th century uh, British philosopher. He lived to be almost 100 years old. Um, very, very interesting fellow, very influential um, in 20th century philosophy published a lot of important and interesting books. He was also a, a public intellectual, um, somebody who, in a sense, brought philosophy into the, the public sphere. Uh, many of his books he wrote quite extensively. Uh, many of his books were really aimed at a, a more general readership, not necessarily specialists in philosophy, but uh, you know, just people interested in philosophical issues. Um, really noted for his, his attempts to try to be really clear about whatever he could be. Uh, and this piece itself, I think, is, is quite clear in some ways. In some other ways, it's also um, rather poetic and, and in some sense artistic. Uh, so he's a very nice writer in, in some sense. So uh, also a winner of a, a Nobel Prize back in 1950 for literature. Um, he's also an a anti-war um, protester in, in the latter part of his life. Um, well, earlier part of his life as well. If I'm remembering correctly off the top of my head, he had to serve some time in prison during World War I because he objected to the, the war. So, um, no, we can sort of stick that aside. He's, he's an interesting character to read up on if, if that sort of thing suits your fancy. So this piece we've got here, uh, Free Man's Worship, comes from his book, uh, 1957, Why I'm Not a Christian. So we're, we're not going to be looking at Russell's sort of broader attitudes towards uh, um, theism or really, well, I, I, we're going to mention his, his attitudes, certainly, because they come up here. Uh, we're not going to really get into the, the arguments. Again, we're not particularly interested in this course in actually examining and assessing arguments for or against religious beliefs. So, you know, we're not looking at, say, the cosmological argument or something, uh, a, a teleological argument aimed to give us reason to believe that a, a god of a particular sort exists. We're not looking at the problem of evil or uh, some other argument to give us reason to think that a god with particular characteristics doesn't exist. Rather, what we're trying to really explore in the course is this issue of the meaning of life. Is there a meaning of life? Is that a good question? If anything can give life meaning, whatever that means, um, is it the same thing for everybody? Does it differ among different sorts of people? Uh, if it does differ in some sense, can we somehow figure out, in general, how we can describe that? You know, can we say something like the meaning of life is doing whatever you find fulfilling, or having a purpose, or doing good deeds, or whatever it might be? So Russell's piece here, or I, I tried to boil it down to three points here again, and this video is not going to be as long as the previous one on Bayer. So first, he affirms a secular scientific view of the world as the correct one. Uh, and so we, we do get a bit of his attitudes here, but not fully his reasoning. Uh, and then the more uh, uh, sort of interesting part of this, the, the part of uh, Russell here that's really going to be in some sense building on, on Bayer and setting the stage for what we're going to be looking at in the rest of this week, and that's going to spill into the, the following week, um, are really our, our reactions and our, our attitudes. If we accept this kind of view of the world, um, what results? Well, Russell is going to say there's there's two different ways we can um, really view the world and our place in it. Uh, and in fact, one of these responses is really the correct one. One of these responses is the one that we should take up because it, it really allows us to overcome the seeming tyranny of our existence. Uh, and it, it's going to allow us to have a good life in some sense. Now, as with Bayer, Russell here isn't necessarily talking about the meaning of life exactly in terms of, he's not sort of taking this phrase, the meaning of life, and trying to exactly do something with it. But rather what he's saying in this piece can certainly be interpreted in such a way uh, as, as seeing Russell providing some kind of view on what the meaning of life is or what it is that makes for a good life overall. Okay, so this first part, this scientific worldview. So like I said, Similar to Bayer, uh, and part of the reason I've got Russell right after Bayer is precisely because I, I think Bayer provides a good sort of summary and, and backdrop of, of a view Russell uh, has a lot of sympathy with. Um, Russell 
really affirms that that's the right view. He, he really agrees with Bayer um, that this contemporary secular scientific view is really the best view that we've got. Um, and he articulates certain key tenets. And I'm, I, I'm actually just realizing here as, as I'm talking uh, and talking about Russell and Bayer that Russell's book, Why I'm Not a Christian, came out the same year that Bayer gave his talk, The Meaning of Life, at the Canberra University College. So I don't think we could say that the one necessarily influenced the other because they were doing this basically at the same time. But I, I think it, in some sense, goes to show that they really cut from the same cloth. They're really, um, I don't like the phrase on the same team because that makes it sound like this is all some kind of sport or something. We drop different teams and only one side can win. I don't think that's a very fruitful way to think about philosophical inquiry. Um, instead, I think perhaps they're uh, approaching matters in a, a similar way. Uh, they're, they're sympathetic to the same sorts of ideas. Uh, they, they reject certain uh, similar sorts of ideas as well. So the key tenets that Russell really subscribes to, uh, which are also ones that, let's say, Bayer subscribes to as well, is that we humans right, are the result of mere chance. Nature is purposeless. Right? There's, there's no obvious uh, reason the way things work the way they do. So just think about Bayer again. Uh, Bayer says, look, teleological explanation is a fine kind of explanation. Science is okay with it. However, uh, it's only appropriate when it seems like something is done for reasons. And it seems like the world around us, largely speaking, especially if you're looking at uh, um, cosmology and looking at different planets and, and solar systems and galaxies and so on, it's really not obvious, at least not to Bayer or Russell, uh, that there is some kind of intelligence at work there. We humans, again, are merely physical beings and there's no afterlife, right? Uh, I, I suppose I should be more particular. No afterlife in the sense of, of personal immortality. Right? Uh, no, after our bodily death, there is no more conscious experience for us. Perhaps that's a much more precise way to put it. Uh, and of course, eventually each of us is going to come to an end. We're going to die. And so will our whole species. Right? Uh, ultimately, there's just no hope. Now, Russell, I think, wasn't being uh, um, imaginative in a certain sense. Uh, we could hope to colonize the stars someday and, and keep our species going beyond our own sun burning out and our Earth either being completely annihilated or made virtually uninhabitable. Um, Russell doesn't explore that, but maybe we can just sort of earmark that and set it off to the side. So ultimately, Russell thinks these, like th this is an accurate description, very broad strokes of, of the world we live in. Um, and these are tenets, you know, th these are beliefs we should hold. These are things that we should regard as true. Why? Because really all of our, our best scientific theories show us this. And even just saying that, you might say, oh, well, who's science to say? Science really is just the, the you know, collection of observations and, and hypothesizing and, and thinking through of things that as a species we've done, right? It's taking observable evidence, trying to come up with some kind of theory of how it all fits together and makes sense testing those theories, testing those hypotheses. When something doesn't fit or doesn't work well, ultimately rejecting it and reaching for something better. And Russell, along with Bayer, would say that really our, our best attempt so far um, at, at looking at what's going on in the world around us and so on, seem to give us evidence that these things are true. Now, Russell claims, uh, and, and this is really part of the, this bridge I'm trying to set up with, um, the next couple of classes this week where we're looking at, at Buddhism and the Schopenhauer, Russell says, you know, it's only within the scaffolding of these truths, only in the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. So Russell himself, in looking at these key tenets, looking at the scientific picture of the world, really affirms that there is, um, a, based on that, there's some reason for despair. And, and this claim that can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. Now, back in the Craig piece, uh, and Craig mentions Russell, at least I believe, I should have gone and double checked that before I started spewing off about it, but I'm virtually certain um, Craig was mentioning Russell in his own remarks, pointing to Russell as an example of an atheist thinker who uh, seems like they have to be inconsistent if they want to be happy. What do I mean here? Or what, what did Craig mean? Well, Really what Russell's saying is that 
our, our best evidence tells us we should believe in that scientific worldview. And that scientific worldview is, well, kind of bleak, right? And we can only safely build the soul's habitation there. What does that mean? Safely, I believe, in the sense of, of making it coherent, making it consistent, uh, making it not at odds with our other observations and best theorizers. So why is there this firm foundation of unyielding despair? Well, really, uh, because in our physical conditions, we're, we're doomed to suffer and eventually die, right? There's just no two ways around it. As moral creatures, eventually we're going to die. Uh, and in fact, we don't control a lot of our own environment. Uh, I think our, our current situation with um, you know, COVID really brings that home. We think we are in uh, pretty good control of, of our surroundings and our lives, but not so much. And in fact, uh, part of that feeling of security itself might be part of our time and place, right? Presumably right now, um, all of us here are, are in Canada, depending on your relations to other parts of the world, you might have a much more um, you know, deep connection to somewhere else than, than say here, than some of the other people in the class might. Uh, but really, you know, we, we don't fully control our, our environments. Uh, we're not fully in control of the world. We can certainly affect the world, we can certainly affect our environment, but we're, we're not the masters of our own domain. Human existence is somewhat precarious. In fact, each of our own lives is somewhat precarious. It's, it's quite easy for the human life to be lost. Now, despite the fact that we're, we have this kind of precarious existence, that uh, we have this foundation of unyielding despair because there's always going to be death, there's always going to be disease and trouble and, and all sorts of different things. Russell wants to put forward a somewhat optimistic view. Despite our physical conditions, the, despite the fact that we're all gonna die, despite the fact that we have limited resources and so on, he says man is yet free during his brief years to examine, to criticize, to know, and in imagination to create. So what Russell is doing in part here is trying to draw attention to uh, the fact that even though in in body, we are limited and vulnerable. In our minds, we are, are free and powerful in some sense. And in fact, Russell thinks it's really only in this, this mental fashion, it's really only in our minds, are we really able to, in some sense, overcome or conquer the sorts of forces, physical forces, that really control our existence and that we, despite our best efforts, cannot and presumably can never fully control. So Russell draws our attention to really these two approaches that we can take to the world. He says we can worship power, we can worship what controls us, or we can worship our, our ideals, our ethical ideals. Uh, and this is where he has a little bit of a discussion of um, the religion of Moloch. Now, if you look up Moloch, um, Moloch's really a, an ancient god. Uh, this, this is, you know, thinking way, way back, good few thousand years back. Uh, Moloch was a, a god that uh, in sort of the, the Mideast, um, a god to which you would sacrifice children, at least sometimes, right? Not everybody, certainly not all the time, otherwise nobody would be left, but um, it's not, not a very nice god not exactly a loving, caring God. Uh, and so really what Russell's trying to draw attention to when he's talking in this section, talks about the religion of Moloch, and he really talks about this worship of power, what he's really getting at is a kind of contractual worship, right? Uh, and we can broadly talk about the polytheistic beliefs of um, many, many peoples back, um, let's just say three, four, five thousand years ago, um, in, in sort of the Near East, you know, Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece, and so on. Uh, we can talk about um, this kind of contractual worship where the relationship between humans and the gods was really this, this kind of contract. You know, we give you things, you give us things. I sacrifice a child, you give me good, good crops, more children, whatever it might be, right? Um, and this is Russ, Russell thinks, and he talks about, so a little bit of the language is certainly dated here, he talks about savages. 
Um, but given the context of what he's saying here, when he's talking about savages, he's not talking about indigenous peoples. He's really talking about these, these older cultures, these older uh, views on religion and, and views on, on deities. Um, so really what he's trying to draw attention to is that one way of, of worshiping or one way of having a relationship with the gods is to engage in kind of barter with them, right? I'll give you this if you give me that. Um, and of course, taking it even to more of an extreme, it's, it's not so much it's a, a barter or a straight up exchange, but rather the gods being more powerful than we are, are going to crush us if we don't do what they want. Right? So the worship of power is really this um, sort of giving into something that can control you, something that can hurt you, something that can destroy you, um, doing what they want merely out of a sense of self-preservation. Right? And Russell thinks that this uh, is, is sort of a, a, a weak kind of response. This itself is almost a kind of slavery. Um, power, he thinks, this kind of course of power is a bad thing. So to give into it and to worship it and to do what it wants just for the sake of, of self-preservation, Russell thinks, is really uh, exhibits a kind of weakness in us. Uh, and he, one other thing I wanna draw attention to just with the quotation I've stuck up on the bottom here, on uh, the last part where he says, in determination to worship only the God created by our own love for good, to respect only a heaven which inspires the insight of our best moments, Russell very much has a, a secular atheistic view of religion and religious beliefs. And even though he's not really talking about it here, there's a couple of spots, including here, where he uh, sort of tips his hand, so to speak. Um, he's, he's really interpreting religious beliefs itself as a human activity. Um, the, the idea of different gods, or you know, we could take particular gods, the Christian God. Okay, even that, we need to be more specific because there are disagreements amongst Christians. Um, different conceptions of gods, different conceptions of deity, different conceptions of piety and correct worship and so on, uh, these are really all constructs. These are things we come up with, right? Um, and so when Russell is talking about, you know, the, the religion of Moloch or to worship the God created by our own love, he's really talking about our different ideals, our different um, uh, sort of intellectual creative products. If we have an idea of God and we think that's the best possible thing, that's really an expression of our own idea, not an apprehension in Russell's view of some actually existing entity out there. So whether you believe in you know, Zeus and Hera or uh, you know, Jesus, God, right? You believe in Moloch or, or whatever it is, Russell says, you know, those are so many different human creations we have. And really you can tell something about the people who hold those beliefs by examining the, the beliefs they hold, right? Um, what they worship as gods tells you what they themselves think is really worth worshiping. Okay, and, and I'll just stick in a side note here. I'm saying this by way of explaining Russell. I'm not automatically endorsing the view and saying, yeah, he's definitely right about it. I'm just trying to shed a little bit more light on, on what he's doing if there are certain passages that you're reading and. It, it just seemed kind of funny. That's what he's getting at, at least in some places. Okay, well, I need to shrink myself down here so you can actually see the, the picture I stuck in. Um, Russell also talks about Promethean revolt. He talks about Prometheus a little bit. So we, you know, in, in looking at our situation in the world, we're really buffeted all the time by, by power. We really aren't in control of our our own lives, our own destiny, so to speak. Uh, and of course, you might resist that, oh no, we can do whatever we want. It's, it's just false. Uh, we don't control the fact that we continue to live, right? If, if we did, if we were fully in control of the fact that we, of, of our own lives, nobody would ever die in an accident uh, or die of a, a medical condition or, right? uh, we just don't have that kind of control. It'd be nice if we did, it's, it's a nice, um, story to tell ourselves that we're that safe and, and that confident, that powerful, but we really aren't. Uh, and so, of course, we can try to worship power, try to placate those sorts of forces to keep them at bay and, and keep ourselves safe. That's one way of doing it, really being a kind of slave to the world. Russell thinks that's an inappropriate response. Um, 
so once we come to realize that our own ideal of, of safety, security, love, you know, companionship, um, leisure, what, whatever it is, right, whatever sort of package of ideals that we have, once we realize that reality is not ideal, right, that in some sense it's, it's suboptimal, um, things could be better, right? We're, we're doomed to suffer to some degree in the world we live in, particularly if there isn't, as Russell thinks there isn't, uh, an existing God, personal immortality, any sort of, of afterlife, um, right? You know, we, we can put this in, in Craig's terms again, or, and of course, we can think Tolstoy and Quinn and so on. But I think Craig really does a nice job in saying, look, what I'm really uh, demanding here for there to be meaning in life is ultimate significance, value, and uh, um, purpose. And without the existence of God, we just don't get those things, right? Uh, so Russell and, and Craig, in a lot of ways, sort of agree on the basic picture of the world. They just uh, evaluate it differently. So they think the description is, is basically correct, right? They both say, oh, look, you're, you're doomed to suffer and eventually die. Uh, in this world, it's really a question of whether or not there can be meaning or value in that if there's no God. Craig says no. Russell ultimately is going to say yes. So we can, uh, in recognizing that the world's suboptimal, recognizing that the world is really not what we want it to be, all things considered, we can have this kind of Promethean revolt. Now, Prometheus, um, part of, of Greek mythology, uh, he was one of the, the titans, one of the sort of crafters and designers of, of humans and all sorts of other things. Um, but he also sort of annoyed um, the gods uh, in part because he stole fire. Uh, so the, this is the Promethean revolt. Prometheus defies Zeus uh, and steals fire from the Olympians and, and gives it to humans. So humans have more power and more sort of capacity um, to, to protect themselves and do things in the world. This, is, this Promethean revolt is really revolting against uh, the most powerful, right? Revolting against the gods. And as a result of his actions, according to, um, you know, some versions of, of these myths, uh, Prometheus gets bound to a, a rock somewhere in the Caucasus Mountains where an eagle comes and eats his liver every day and then it grows back. And this is supposed to be his eternal torment. Now, this Promethean revolt, right, trying to revolt against this hostile and different universe, you know, trying to steal the fire, trying to better our position and so on, uh, this results in a form of indignation, Russell says, and it's really still a kind of submission to power or, or being trapped uh, and oppressed by power because it compels our thoughts to be occupied with an evil world. Right? Um, if, we, if we sort of look at the world and we realize that it's not a great place, and that's not everything we want out of it if we were making it or, or designing it or we, all our wishes came true. Um, we can sort of revolt against it and shake our fist, you know, at the, our cosmic situation and say, oh, well, you know, it's um, you know, screw the world and we'll show it by doing whatever. But even that kind of revolt, that kind of relationship to the world, that kind of antagonism, um, itself is really a form of, of being trapped or, or repressed um, kind of submission, right? It, it keeps us in a somewhat subservient relationship with the world because we still feel the need to revolt against it. Right? Um, and of course, you can extend this analysis to all sorts of other things. Whatever you feel the need to um, be indignant towards or revolt against in some sense, uh, is something that still has a power over you because you still uh, are, are thinking about it and you're focused on it and, and deciding what to do about it and so on. Okay, so one thing we can do is have this kind of Promethean revolt, but that's still really trapping us in uh, the, the power of the world. It's really keeping us in this kind of subservient role. We're not, we're not free yet, right? We're, we're still enslaved to something. But instead of submitting our thoughts and retaining our desires in, in that Promethean revolt, now what does that really amount to? Uh, submitting our thoughts and retaining our desires It's still wanting certain things, right? It's wanting, say, a perfect life or immortality or whatever exactly it is, right? It's wanting it and realizing we don't have it. So submitting our thoughts in the sense of, of still being trapped, being indignant, still having that relationship that holds us down in some sense. Russell says we can actually flip this. We, we can change our, our attitude. We can have a different kind of response. 
and we can um, really submit our desires instead of our thoughts. All right, what, what does that mean? Or, or what do I mean by that, by way of explaining Russell? Uh, Russell says this is really Stoic freedom. And so the Stoics were um, a group of, of Greek philosophers. Um, as a philosophical movement, it became very prominent during the, the Roman Empire. So think roughly sort of second century uh, BCE to second, third century CE. Uh, so, you know, maybe 500 years ish of. Um, Stoic thinking was really popular throughout the Roman Empire, Greek world, and so on. Uh, and, and in fact, you can see in, in Stoicism, um, you know, we, we still talk about Stoics and, and talk about people um, putting up with things stoically or, or going through them. And really, the, the Stoics, um, just in general, sort of the Stoics in a nutshell, they thought that the whole world was governed by a kind of divine reason. Um, so, so this whole notion of, of you know, God's plan. Um, well, a good couple of centuries before Christ, you've got the Stoics going around talking about um, uh, one God who is, controls everything, uh, has a plan, that we all play a part in this plan, that we have a freedom of choice over what we ourselves do, but of course we can't control the world around us. And so we have to come to accept the fact that while we're free to make our own choices, we are not free to make the world go the way we want, that the world is bigger than us, it's more powerful than us, um, and that ultimately the world is going to do precisely what it's going to do, and that's all divinely ordained and so it's something good. Um, but we ourselves have no idea what part we're ultimately going to play in it, and uh, we just have to accept whatever part we're given, whatever that might be. And so here Russell is talking uh, about you know this, this alternative approach we can take. Instead of revolting against the world and really being upset about our, our position in it and the fact that it's not giving us what we want. Instead, what we can do is try to make our desires actually fit our situation. So rather than being upset with our, our place in the world, instead we can come to accept and even desire our situation. And from this, this freedom, this freedom of thought, uh, liberating ourselves by being able to think beyond our situation and think about the world at large rather than our own small private interests. This was another feature of Stoicism, this kind of universalism. Think about everybody. Don't just think about yourself. Think about all of humanity because we are all really one, one large family. Um, Russell says, from the freedom of our thoughts, this kind of Stoic freedom, springs the whole world of art and philosophy and the vision of beauty by which at last we reconquer the reluctant world. Now, this response, really submitting our desires, being happy with, with what we have, with where we are, Russell thinks this is the better response. Right? It's far better to do this than to have that, that indignation and revolt. He also thinks this is the response that religion has generally endorsed. So like I've been saying, um, you, know, you can see certain elements here of Stoicism in, in Christianity. You can also see it in is, Islam. You can see it, right, to some degree in, in Judaism as well. And of course, you know, we can say, well, look, Judaism is older than Stoicism, so what direction does that go? These sorts of relationships are complicated. So really, I'm just trying to draw attention to certain family resemblances. So even though Russell himself is, is an atheist, he endorses the secular scientific worldview and not a theistic um, worldview and, and not a theistic response to this issue of the meaning of life, uh, he thinks that there is something sort of wise, there's something very sensible in a lot of, of religious approaches and religious attitudes. Now, one thing I want to point out that Russell himself doesn't really hear is that we can, we can talk about a kind of religious attitude or something that religion in general uh, perhaps has, you know, identified or, or put its finger on or highlighted. Um, and we can separate that off from the, the actual attitudes and, and beliefs of all believers, right? So just because somebody is a believer in a certain religion doesn't necessarily mean they're going to share all the, the attitudes of that religion and, and vice versa. Um, so Russell really shares certain attitudes that you can find amongst different schools of philosophy, amongst different religions and so on. Um, you know, I think we can identify this as well in, in to some degree Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism. Um, there's, there's something interesting going on there about having your desires really uh, match 
the world around you and match your position in that world. Um, that's something we can pick out and, and identify in a lot of places and, and find a lot of sources for it. And Russell thinks this is really the right way to go. It's not by hanging on to our desires and being upset at the world because it's not what we want it to be. Rather, instead, what we can do is, is come to really uh, accept the world for, for what it is and accept our own limited, uh, vulnerable position in it. And then we can free our own thinking from our own sort of narrow self-interest, right? We can start approaching the world in a different kind of way. And this is really what he thinks it is to start becoming wise, right? And, and presumably, you know, being, being wise, having the right kind of attitude and, and relationship with the world ultimately is necessary to lead a meaningful life. So ultimately, Russell thinks we should reject certain aims. We should give up on certain goals, on, on certain sorts of desires. We just have to accept that we will never be able to achieve some things, and eventually we lose everything through, through death, right? Tolstoy's right, eventually it's all gone. Uh, but in the meantime, before you get there, there are just some things you can't do, right? And, and of course, um, we, can, we can argue about the specifics on this, um, and of course, look, some people do really wonderful things, right? And this isn't supposed to be discouraging in the sense of, of you know, oh, you know, don't, don't pursue your dreams or, or don't try very hard because no matter what, you're going to fail anyway. It's not exactly that, but rather what Russell's trying to draw attention to is that um, we can never guarantee success in what we do. Uh, and there are some projects that no matter how hard you try, uh, you're, you're just almost certainly doomed to failure depending on, on where you set your sights. So, even if we do succeed, generally speaking, there's no guarantee to it. So Russell thinks really our best response is, is tempered by the sort of renunciation as well as a kind of idealization. So the renunciation is really of impossible goals, of things that we can't achieve, um, and, and really being stuck on something you can't achieve is one almost surefire way to guarantee that you're gonna be unhappy, and that you've got a relationship with the world that, that really isn't what you'd like it to be. So returning to an example I, I think I brought up, might have been the Bayer lecture, I'm, I'm not really sure anymore. Um, you know, if I am just committed to, I need to be the most famous country music singer in the world by the time I'm 40, it, maybe that's not sort of logically impossible, uh, but it, it's just not gonna happen. I, I, I can guarantee you, I, will, I would bet everything I have on the fact that it's not gonna happen even if I try my hardest. Uh, there's lots of other things that I, I just really, I'm not gonna achieve, right? Uh, and certainly, if, if I were really set on some kind of goal that's now already failed, right? So say, by the time I was 25, I wanted to be the big, uh, biggest country music singer in the world. I'm not 25 anymore. If that is just the, the goal I set for myself and I think that my life only goes well if I, I met that goal, well, I didn't meet it. So I'm just doomed to failure and unhappiness. So why, why stay committed to that, right? Why stay committed to something you can't achieve? This is what, really what Russell's getting at, that it's, it's wise, it's sensible to give up on certain impossible goals, right? You can't be perfectly safe. You can't live forever. You can't be the best at absolutely everything. So try to strive for all of those things. Um, it, it living forever in sort of the, right, current life bodily form. I'm, I'm not sort of trying to speak in atheism through the back door here. Uh, really what Russell's getting at is that you, you've got to be, in some sense, realistic in your goals. And he's not saying just give up and do nothing, but rather you, you've got to be realistic and, and recognize the limits on our own power and our, our situation in the world. So we need to really give up on the impossible, right? The things that we just can't do. And we need to give up on that kind of fixation of, of changing our situation such that, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be perfectly powerful and safe and so on. Now, we can, once we give up on that, once we just come to accept in, in broad strokes our position in the world and what we are able to do, Russell thinks we can start to have a really appreciative relationship with this otherwise hostile world, right? We can retain our ideals, we can still um, find things of value and value them, even in the face of this ultimate, you know, death and annihilation that we're going to have. So if, if we take Russell and Tolstoy and sort of stick them together for a moment, they're similar in broad outline, um, 
that before Tolstoy turns to, to faith and he turns to this connection to the infinite, he says, well, look, if I'm just stuck with the finite, if I'm stuck with the scientific understanding of things, then it all ends in stench and worms and death and everything gets annihilated. And Russell says, yeah, that's right. And Tolstoy says, so that means none of it really matters. None of it's really worth doing then if that's what it is. That's where Russell disagrees. So I don't see how that follows. Right? Even if the world is hostile, even if we don't control our own fates, we can still hold to our ideals and try to live a good life. Now, this is where I think Russell's at his most poetic in some sense. Uh, so if you want to engage with Russell, my, my sort of just general advice would be to try to nail down exactly what it is he's, he's saying, particularly in this last part. Um, you know, what, what's, what's he really trying to get? How, how can we express it in not such poetic terms? But Russell really thinks we can, you know, once we've freed ourselves from this kind of um, enslavement or uh, um, indignation to the world, this the subservient sort of relationship we have to it when we feel trapped by it, uh, we can really change our, our own attitude. Um, we can conquer fate, so to speak, and conquer our situation by approaching it differently. And so here again, I'll just invoke the Stoics for a moment. The Stoics uh, really you know, held, held the image that somebody could be a happy slave. So they existed when like, owning slaves was fairly common and, and widespread. And, and their attitude really was that we aren't um, just our, our bodies, we really are our minds or souls in some sense. Uh, and so no matter your material situation, right, even if you were owned as a slave and beaten and so on, they said you could still accept your situation in the world. It's difficult, but you could just accept that that's where you are. And in fact, you can in some sense conquer your own situation by accepting it. Right? You can overcome it in some sense. Now, Russell himself takes on a similar kind of attitude. He thinks, you know, practically speaking, what should we do? We should be good people. Uh, if we think that helping others is good, if we think, uh, you know, peace and, and security and love are good things, then they're good no matter our cosmic situation. It doesn't matter if our species is going to come to an end. It doesn't matter if we ourselves are going to come to an end. Those good things remain good, even if there is no God, even if there is no sort of eternal significance to what we do. Even if, you know, in a trillion years, if some species came along, they'd never know if we were here or did right or did wrong. It doesn't change the fact that now, here, things are right or wrong, and that we ought to help each other as best we can. Not only should we, so practically speaking, just be good people, and Russell doesn't have any you know, particular advice here. He's not trying to get in, involved in, uh, you know, sort of, uh, philosophical ethics or something and advocate utilitarianism or anything like that. Uh, so we should just try to be sort of good people in general. That's, that's still a good thing. Uh, and through our intellectual activities, Russell thinks that we can really master um, anything, everything. We can master death and, and fate and time. We can master this hostile and different universe by coming to understand it, right? And in fact, we overcome our, our unfortunate situation when we give up on the pursuit of, of selfish private happiness and instead engage in uh, more communal pursuits where we, we're concerned with other people and, and how everyone is doing. Uh, and we overcome this hostile and different world by coming to understand it and retaining our own ideals in the face of it. So as Russell puts it, to abandon the struggle for private happiness to expel all eagerness of temporary desire, to burn with passion for eternal things. This is emancipation, and this is the free man's worship. And this liberation is effected by contemplation of fate, for fate itself is subdued by the mind, which leaves nothing to be purged by the purifying fire of time. So, and, and he's got several uh, passages like this where he is, is very poetically making the, the point he's trying to make. But also, like, what is he trying to get at here? Well, look, the struggle for private happiness, right? If really what we're trying to do is get ahead and make sure we're okay and make sure we're secure and so on, 
ultimately, it is not in our power to ensure that that's what happens. This, this is one of Russell's points. So you can commit your life to getting ahead and, and doing well and so on, but it, there's no guarantee it's going to work. And ultimately, you are, are stuck with the same end as everybody else. We're, we are all doomed to die at some point. Not only doomed to die, but doomed to suffer in the meantime. As long as you care about anything, you are open to potential suffering. Uh, right by, by its loss or its damage. So we can get rid of that. We sort of overcome and, and reject that selfish, egoistic pursuit of, of individual sort of well-being and happiness and instead sort of spread our desires out and, and really um, be more unified with other people, see our own doing well being wrapped up in their doing well. Um, not only that, but we can really emancipate ourselves from the these sort of trials and tribulations and limitations we have uh, put on our condition by our limited power by being passionate about eternal things, really intellectual pursuits, artistic pursuits. Russell thinks there's still something eternal there. Now, something I just want to um, put to you, something to think about. So this, so look, this, this is the end of my remarks on, on Russell here. Um, something I want to put to you to, to think about is that Tolstoy and Russell seem to have fairly uh, sort of broad agreement in some ways and then fairly broad disagreement in others. For Tolstoy, it seems to follow that if uh, we don't have a connection to the infinite, if our lives end to death and so on, then there really are no eternal things worth pursuing, right? There, there aren't eternal ideals or uh, um, eternally worthwhile things or really just nothing seems to be worthwhile. And again, Craig, I think, illustrates this point really uh, well, in addition to Tolstoy. Russell rejects that though. He, he agrees, he says, yes, okay, so, you know, Russell thinks there is no God, and there's no afterlife and so on. That scientific picture is the, the right one, as, as Bayer was pointing out, really best we can hope for is to understand how it all works and how it all fits together. Um, but it's not gonna give us any ultimate plan. It's not gonna give us uh, you know, God's plan or, or some kind of ideal afterlife immortality to look forward to. We're stuck with, you know, here and, and now to some degree. We're stuck living the, the physical lives we live, but we can overcome it uh, and, and make it better by focusing on things outside of ourselves and really at, at the best, these eternal things, these intellectual things, these artistic and otherwise valuable things that transcend our limited situation. Should we, should we think that? Right? Why does Russell think that? He seems to declare it here, again, in an often almost poetic verse. But has he given us good reason to believe that there are such eternally valuable things or, or uh, that our situation is really made better or somehow that we, we conquer the world by coming to understand it and freeing ourselves from our desires that seem to be inevitably frustrated by? We're going to take a look next day at uh, a piece by Gowans, which is going to discuss Buddhism. And then after that, we're going to take a look at Schopenhauer. Both of those pieces are going to have uh, a real emphasis on pain and suffering. So both of those pieces, like Russell, and this is why Russell's in here now, uh, take as a basic fact that life is, is really characterized by quite a lot of suffering, right? That to live as a human is really to live a life with a considerable amount of suffering. Both uh, Schopenhauer and, and the Buddha uh, seem to take a different kind of reaction to that than does Russell here. Uh, they also take a different, they also have a different reaction to that situation than do the theistic responses that we've looked at. So we're gonna look at those in the, in the next couple of days. And then next week, we're gonna be turning to some responses to pessimism as well as to, to theism. Um, and so we're going to hear some, some echoes of Russell on there, plus some, some new content, some new reasons, some new details to consider. And then we're also going to take a look at absurdism, which really, in some sense, spills out of this, this whole notion of revolt, a kind of Promethean revolt against a world that doesn't live up to our expectations. We're going to see Camus really endorse a situation like that, but ultimately conclude that life remains meaningless. And then we're going to see Thomas Nagel make a reappearance, uh, arguing against Camus, and really telling us that 
Um, our situation might be absurd, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's meaningless. So I'll stop my remarks here for today. I hope you're all doing well, and you'll see me tomorrow when I'm discussing Buddhism and Gallon's Greek. Bye for now.